Oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's good to see you. It's been too long. It's it's been good to it's good to see you too. It's been a long time. I know that last time we teased these cases that we were going to talk about, so everyone's probably really excited about that. Um, but it, we did want to share some great feedback. Uh, we did comment a couple episodes ago about how um, the uh, the email inbox has been a little quiet for the um, uh, for the podcast. So handpodcast at gmail.com. If, make sure to email us questions and everything. Um, but we had some really great feedback from listeners. And, and you know, David Wells is one of them. He's an orthopedic NP that uh, previously worked in foot and ankle and switched over to hand and has enjoyed uh, listening to us uh, uh, on the go and while driving. So thanks, David, for that very kind email. Um, and uh, let's see, our next one is from uh, a good old friend, Bob Vandermark. Uh, he's written a couple of times and thanked us for the podcast and wished us a happy new year. So um, he liked uh, um, he liked our talk about carpal tunnel and practice guidelines. And, you know, so thanks for that, uh, Bob. And uh, Clifford Johnson, a surgeon that's not too far from us uh, on the Illinois side, he sent a very nice email um, saying that uh, he understands how we're going to Q2 weeks. He's surprised it took us this long. I think Bob Vandermark said about the same thing too. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we really appreciate everything that, uh, uh, everybody's written in. Um, you know, there was a, a podcast listener, uh, Nikhil Agarwal, who was at the, um, uh, at the associate hand association meeting and didn't have the quote nerve to say hi, but I uh, wanted to write in and, uh, and tell us how much he loved the podcast. So, uh, yes, thank you to all of you for, um, for your kind comments. So those are great. I, I love those. I can share a few as well. So, you know, if you aren't on our um, upper hand podcast email list, uh, write in and, and we'll put you on the list. I promise they're not that frequent. <laughs> um, sometimes there's information and sometimes it's an update, but I, I don't know. We probably over the last year since we were two, we probably sent out one every three or four months. So recently we sent one out notifying all about the change in cadence to every other week. And we've got some great responses. So I'll read a couple of those. Um, so this first one is near and dear to my heart. This is Matthew DeWolf who's a hand and upper extremity surgeon at Berkshire Orthopedic Associates. Now, Chris, I don't know if you know where the Berkshires are. Maybe you do. I hope you do. Uh, given sounds, you... sounds like there's some fancy money in, <laughs> in that area. Well, the Berkshires are where Williams College is located, which is ah, where I went, there we go. To, went to school. So it's the... So I um... hear. <laughs> <laughs> Once Apparently they just grow, they grow hand surgeons on trees at Williams. <laughs> they do. So kind of Western Mass, beautiful part of this country. So Matt was very nice and said some really nice things and thanked us for the time and energy we put into this. I find it very entertaining and educational. And he had some suggestions, including an HBR, to HBR topic, uh, which we already covered. So thanks, Matt. Fantastic. Um, um, this will be an interesting one. I may have forwarded this on to you. Brittany Mitchell is an occupational therapist and uh, really said that... Uh, I still listen on my drives to work and to indoor swim lessons for my three and five year old. Uh, most of my time recently has been dedicated to studying for the CHT, but she wants us to talk more about mallet fingers, which is not the most exciting topic, but there's a lot there. So I think we could have a good uh, mallet conversation at some point for sure. Yep. Um, That's what the people want, Chuck. We got to do it. <laughs> Sharon, Sta uh, Sharon Stanley is a plastic hand surgeon at LSU New Orleans. She's early in her practice, sees a lot of polytrauma and devastating upper, upper extremity injuries. Um, she feels that she sees a lot of CRPS, more than she realized previously, and would love to hear our thoughts on it. Um, maybe we can even talk about that one. Um, and then... I think the others we can mention another time. What do you think about that? How often do you see CRPS and do you find it associated with major traumas or, or what's, what's your been, what's your experience been Mr. Nerd I, uh, guru? Well, I think that I see it. Um, I see it more than other people, uh, a, because of my practice and B because I recognize it more. It's one of those things where you may not see it, but it'll see you. Um, and it's, it is such a tough condition to, to treat. Um, and, you know, I think we probably should do an episode on CRPS and we should have uh, our therapy friend Macy on the episode for that, because I think that it's it's such a challenging condition that will not be treated solely by the surgeon, although the surgeon certainly can have a role in treatment. Um, 
But uh, the nastiest ones are the crush injuries and the dog bites. Yeah, in my in my practice, it's typically a referred patient, maybe from another hand surgeon or or not. And I'm always, and we should talk about this. It's a great a great idea for an episode. I think we've talked about talking about this, but we never did it. Um, it's a great idea for an episode, and and I uh, I think there's a lot to share. I never mind seeing those patients, but I always lay out the expectations for my visit. If as a hand surgeon I can help you, I'll do just that. If I can't then you're better served with another physician. And I think that's an important kind of parameter to set early. Right, right, right. You know, but it's interesting though. It, it, our role as hand surgeons, we're probably the ones physician-wise where we know a lot about certain things. Um, and if there isn't a physician that is better equipped, even if you're not providing a surgical service, sometimes I feel like we should still quarterback or run points on the situation. Um, now, CRPS, you know, I think especially type one, um, you know, the pain management uh, teams are fantastic at, at handling that from a very multidisciplinary manner. Um, but, uh, you know, I had somebody recently who didn't have a firm diagnosis, but clearly I think what we were doing for her in terms of guiding therapy, et cetera, um, was helpful. And I didn't think anybody else would be able to help them out. So I was like, yeah, just come back. And I, I walked out of the room and was like, I don't know why we're having them come back, but I think we're probably the best people to take care of them. And, you know, one of our former partners and mentors, uh, Dr. Gelbman, would always tell me in clinic, Chris, the buck stops here. <laughs> if you don't figure this out, nobody else will. I, was like, I remember that every day. Well, it's true. I, I um, That's another good topic to discuss. You know, what do you do when you can't figure things out? What do you order? Who do you consult? There's all kinds of strategies that... Uh, we've developed, and I'm sure you think about things differently than I do, but uh, ultimately owning it and doing your darndest is is the right approach. Right. Well, thank you for uh, for those that wrote in to uh, and replied to the to the um, to the listserv uh, about uh, you know episode feedback and suggestions. Um, I have a question that came out of the uh, um, the email account, if that's all right. So it is about uh, thinking about. C5 brachial plexus nerve bridge. Oh, no, <laughs> say it isn't so. No, but it was actually spurred about uh, by listening to the radial nerve uh, tendon transfer versus nerve transfer episode. And this is from uh, Nick Coudre. Sorry, Nick, if I didn't pronounce your last name properly. He's actually an outpatient OT up in our neck of the woods. Uh, he's up in North County. So he's seen some of our patients too. And he's seen one of my plexus patients and was just asking in terms of timing, you know, what, what you expect in terms of... Uh, the the recovery timeline after for nerve transfers. I, I think that probably it it in theory is a little similar, but a lot of it depends on the distance to target in terms of you know how far the nerve has to regrow to get to the muscle and then how long it takes to mature. There are certain nerve transfers that just take a longer time to mature, even once in reinnervation has actually started and that process has has begun when the nerve has hit the muscle. Um I don't know, have have you noticed a, a big difference in terms of certain um nerve regenerations over the years and when you were treating more of the traumatic nerve injuries? Well, I, I mean, I, I assume my sense, I hope my sense is accurate in that I find radial, and I, it's not just distance, and what, you're, what I'm trying to interpret is, it's not just about distance to innervation point, it's just the nerve itself has intrinsic characteristics, which might be slower or faster. Yeah, right. for, for me, it's radial nerve faster than median nerve, faster than ulnar nerve, but I would love to be corrected if I have that wrong. No, I think that's right. I think you know, one of the challenges I think with the radial nerve is that it's, um, if you, I was actually looking at the radial nerve today during a nerve transfer case, it's such a, I mean, this is so nerdy, but it's such a fascinating <laughs> nerve. It. It's such a fascinating nerve. Like when you look at it, like right at the so-called uh, spiral groove, that doesn't, isn't really a groove, but yeah, you know, when you look at it there, it's just got so much fat uh and it's it's not as a uh, it's not as a nice organized and defined set of tubes like the ulnar nerve is in the brachium like the median nerve is in the brachium and i think that's probably why the radial nerve responds differently to very high or proximal repairs or reconstructions there's something about the fat content of that nerve the soft the soft tissue around the nerve, the, the mesonurium, et cetera, that makes it a little more challenging to align that properly and probably has some implications for actual nerve regeneration. Um, but I think as you're more distal, yes, I agree with exactly what you said in terms of how nerves will respond. 
but even as you, you know, some of the papers that look at reconstructing and grafting radial nerves in the distal half and distal third of the brachium, they do better than people that are more proximal. And that might be distance to target. That might be because the nerve just becomes more structured and more like the median and ulnar nerve as you get into the lower half, just above the elbow. So I have to ask you a question. Were you in the, here's what, here's what I'm visualizing. Dr. D is in the OR. He's looking at the radial nerve and all of a sudden someone is snapping saying, Dr. D, Dr. D, come, <laughs> come back with us. <laughs> I did actually say, I was like, man, radial nerve is so fascinating. I actually said that out loud. I was like, I can't believe I just said that. But yes, they had to, they had to bring me back, bring me back to the moment. We talked about being present in our last episode. I was, nice. I was off in my own world thinking Every about the radial nerve. It's, you know, when someone loves nerve, they love nerve and you, you know, we just have to accept that about you. Exactly. It's, it's a, uh, it is, it's something that you just got to deal with. And so I will did, say one more, one more uh, listener email. Um, did we answer the question though? I don't even remember. I think we, we did. I, think we did. I mean, okay. it, Plexus is such a, you know, grab bag in terms of, you know, you don't always have your routine transfers, you know, in terms of, yes, sometimes you can do your classic SOMSAC, triceps, the axillary, and your double overland or double fascicular, or whatever you want to call it. Sometimes you don't have that and you're dealing with what you, what's available. And, and I think that's the allure and the challenge uh, all in one. Um, but the lack of predictability will drive some people a little bit crazy, especially if you're in the therapy side of it. That is fair. That is fair. Well said. Um, there's one more email I wanted to go through. Uh, Dr. Sarah Shippers uh, is a uh, freshly minted orthopedic hand surgeon, first year in practice, and really enjoyed the uh, the radial nerve uh, tendon versus nerve episodes, and especially the therapy episode, because now she has a podcast that she can, uh, a resource she can send uh, her therapist to, uh, since they may not see this kind of uh, a rehab on a regular basis. Uh, so she's very happy about that. And she thanked us for our ed dedication to hand surgery education. So that was very kind of you, Sarah. Thank you for sending that um, when you did. Absolutely. Oh, I thought there was going to be a question in there. Oh, no. I just wanted to thank you for all that you've done, Chuck. Oh, I love that. That's so nice. Good luck. And uh, hopefully the Upper Hand Podcast is your partner uh, in this career journey. <laughs> and, and I agree with that. And the Upper Hand Podcast is sponsored by PracticeLink.com, the most widely used physician job search and career advancement resource. Nice, nice, nice. Becoming a physician is hard. Finding the right job doesn't have to be. Join PracticeLink for free today at www.practicelink.com backslash the upper hand. Just go to the site and look at it. It's pretty impressive. I'm not telling you to switch jobs, but it's always nice to know what's out there. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, uh, I may go look now, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. So speaking of switching jobs, can we can we digress? Is it appropriate for me to digress and talk about the NBA trade deadline? How exciting that was. Wow, that's yes. I was just uh, talking with somebody about how the Brooklyn Nets, you know, basically dealt their entire roster. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You know, it is interesting that there was so much excitement around the NBA uh, during Super Bowl week, which by the time this episode drops, is going to be long over. But uh, it, it, the, the, it, the NBA, I really enjoy in part because it can be so unpredictable. Yes, yes. The word shit show often comes up. But <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I, how do you feel? I mean, and this is not a sports podcast or at least about actual sports, um, but you are an expert in uh in basketball so do you think these are good moves made by the teams that uh you know are the suns going to be happy or the mavs going to be happy the suns are going to be happy if everyone stays healthy and they I, I would predict they'll come out of the west and play the boston celtics if everyone's healthy um my golden state warriors um it's, it's looking like an uphill uphill battle for them Dallas and uh, now, you know, with Kyrie, um, you know, we don't want to get too detailed here. That that one's going to be a tough one. Um, so a lot of excitement around the trade deadline, which just makes the NBA more exciting. And I was thinking on my drive in as I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts, uh, aside from this one, um, Bill Simmons, who talks about really the NFL and the NBA. And it's just there's so many characters. And I was trying to think NBA characters. Are there those same characters in the hand society? that we just don't know about for sure. I will not tell you who I think the Kyrie Irving of the hits. <laughs> <laughs> that thought did cross my mind. And I actually had a sense you were going there. <laughs> that is so funny. I'm sure we all have our little, yes, this person is X and that person's Y. 
Uh, because hand surgery is super exciting, Doctor D, and and it's just as exciting as the NBA. Our, our nerdy, our nerdy little world. So yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something. Sometimes you say something out loud, hoping that it comes, you know, to keep yourself accountable, so it'll For come sure. true. I'm gonna say something out loud in hopes that it doesn't come true. <laughs> um, so I, in right now, I, my role as fourth assistant coach of the first grade basketball team of my kids' team. They they have, of course, put practices on Thursdays at 3 p.m., which means I can <laughs> never, ever make it. I was like, come on, guys. Like, seriously, I couldn't even do like an extra hour later. But, but um, I actually happened to make it, uh, you know, yesterday, uh, which was super exciting uh, because, uh, you know, my son was jazzed that I was there. Uh, and some of the some of the coaches and dads were talking about uh, setting up a little pickup game, um, you know, on one of the weeknights uh and I am totally in, uh, but I'm going to put it out here that I really do not want my Achilles tendon to rupture because I feel like that is the the setup. Uh, I I like I pride myself in being in, in very reasonable shape and I can do a lot of things, but I think the sprinting and the stop start up and down the court might be a little too much for me. Oh, it's not too much. Your strength will be just that. If you warm up appropriately, you know, the first game to see what happens. And after that, the other dads are going to get tired and you're going to be going strong. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I need to I need to stretch. That's actually what I need to do. But you know, we've we had a couple of really nice days here recently in St. Louis, and uh, you know, very happy with myself. I went and banged out an eight mile run in the park. I uh, kind of didn't realize I was going to do that, and I paid for it the next day for sure. Wow, but that's great. Yeah, it, we did have some nice days, and those first few nice days are absolutely inspiring. Hopefully, others across the country are getting to experience the same. But it wasn't even that warm. It was like mid fifties, but it was sunny and beautiful. Oh, mid fifties is great. Are you kidding me? <laughs> our our friends in Florida are like, ah, you suckers. <laughs> um. So, well, we talked about being workaholics in in the last episode, and I will say I'm a bit. I've known to be a bit competitive, and um, you know, one of our partners, uh, Dr. David Brogan, is a marathon runner and a very skilled long distance runner, and I always want to tell him, like, you know, I just. I, I want to be able to tell him at any point that I could run a half marathon. So I just, I, that's my, my crazy fitness goal is to be able to say, yeah, I just banged out a, you know, 13 miles, you know, I'm, I still got it, David. I could catch you at some point. <laughs> here's, here's my life advice. Do it now because when you're old, like I am, that ship has sailed. I've finally admitted it. That ship has sailed. I, I'd be happy to walk a half marathon. I've I've gotten my fill. I think I'm done with marathons, although I may meet my midlife crisis. And, uh, you know, I had, I had a good couple and uh, I think I'm good. So anyway, why don't we talk about some actual hand surgery before people turn this off? Yeah, maybe too late. All right. What do we oh, you want to share a case? Yeah, an interesting case, um, you know, that uh, was referred to me by one of my partners, uh, one of our partners, um, a patient who had had a prior subcutaneous transposition elsewhere. Or actually started as an in situ, then uh, was revised to a subcutaneous transposition, and then came in with just a boatload of pain right over the just anterior to the medial epicondyle. Um, tap on that area, it drives him absolutely crazy. The nerve itself is actually functioning pretty well, the ulnar nerve, insensate in the posterior branch of the medial endobrachial cutaneous nerve distribution. So I see the patient. Uh, our partner is convinced it's an MABC neuroma and uh, nothing else. And I kind of thought that was the case. And um, you know, we get a nerve study. Nerve study comes back, essentially that the ulnar nerve is working pretty darn good, which anytime you're going into a revision surgery, you're like, oh man, <laughs> it can only make that worse. Um, but uh, an ultrasound, very compelling, shows just a huge honking neuroma for the MABC. Um, so how do you approach that patient who's got a functioning ulnar nerve but has pain and you suspect that there's a neuroma in that area? So you believe that irritated uh, segment is the ulnar nerve itself right at the right at or on the medial epicondyle in addition to a reactive cutaneous nerve? Yeah, and no, I actually thought it was more the reactive cutaneous nerve because the ulnar nerve, you know, Motor sensory function and clinical exam was pretty good, and a nerve study was pretty good, and the nerve was not terribly enlarged on the on the ultrasound, but the MABC was the size of the ulnar nerve. It was like the same cross-sectional area. So I actually thought it was an MABC surgery, but I was going to be right next to the ulnar nerve. Right. Well, I guess my uh, a couple of comments, you know, 
we have discussed this, it, the literature proves this, a failed decompression is, is not as easy as simply transposing the nerve. And um, that's why I take even more care in that decision-making process today, because we know from Dr. Calfee's paper that those patients just don't do as well. So that's number one. Number two, I really like that fasciocutaneous or, or adipose flap anteriorly rather than an eaten flap with fascia, because I think it allows you to keep the nerve more lateral and away from the medial epicondyle. I don't think the nerve is happy, and you may disagree, I don't think that nerve is quite as happy when it's really far medial or near the bone. That's my second takeaway. And then my third comment regarding planning is I would plan to go in and evaluate that medial brachial cutaneous nerve, neurolyse it, or potentially excise it if, if that looks like the best um, indicator, of course, with preoperative discussions around numbness, and then assess the nerve. And if the nerve is scarred in and doesn't look good, then I think you have to go submuscular with it. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, I think the nerve does not like being uh, right next to the medial epicondyle if it's on top of it. I think that if you're going submuscular, I think it's okay to put the nerve, you know, closer to the bone as long as it's you get them moving early. Because um, if you put it closer to the bone on the anterior side of it, or you know, not you know where it sits in situ, but on the other side of the medial epicondyle, closer to the median nerve, um, you know, that's a nice smoother course for that nerve. It is much more likely to be in a straight line. And topographically, it doesn't have to go up and down like it would if you did it, uh, you know, with a subcutaneous. So if you're doing a subcutaneous, I think it is important to pull it away from the medial epicondyle. And I've seen some fail um, or have to be revised, um, have to is a strong term, but would benefit from revision because it was just right on the bone, right on top of the bone. Interesting. Yeah. So what did you do in this case? So we planned for revision surgery. Um, it was mainly a, a medial, it was supposed to be an MABC neuroma surgery, but I said, we're going to be in the area. I always have my guard up about the ulnar nerve. There's a fair chance I'll need to revise your transposition um, just because I don't want anybody to have, ever have to come back here again, um, especially if your nerve is, the ulnar nerve ends up being the source of your pain. So we open everything up, obviously wide exposure on both ends. Um, and find the ulnar nerve, and it is just plastered to the flexor pronator surface really close to the medial epicondyle. And it matched the preoperative tenel sign that we marked, which I had thought was going to be more the medial antibrachial cutaneous uh, neuroma. And I always mark the preop tenel and holding because I think it can be a useful guide, and it shows a patient, um, too, kind of what your plan is. And, you know, lo and behold, I mean, immediately next door to it, there was a huge honking neuroma for the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. So I'm not absolutely sure what the pain generator was, if it was one or the other or a combination of the two. Um, but it was a it was a slog to get that nerve out, the ulnar nerve out of that scar. Wow. And so you neuralized the ulnar nerve, you excised the neuroma and the branch of the medial brachial. Um, is that accurate? Yeah, so we revised the we did a neurolysis on the ulnar nerve and did a submuscular transposition, kind of the normal one. Left it very loose in terms of uh, you know the any area around the nerve. And I did something that I had not done in this particular situation before, but I thought was interesting. Um, you know, there was always there we always have our branches to the FCU, um, and I found a couple of branches to FCU, and and we ended up doing a targeted muscle reinnervation um, from the MABC. Um, you know, neuroma branch. Uh, so we excised out the neuroma and went back to healthy fascicles. We did have to use a um, an allograft to make that TMR reach. But, you know, I'm not sure which part of this neuroma treatment is going to be the thing that uh, that helps the most, whether it's the excision of the painful neuroma, whether it's the nerve growing into the allograft, or whether it's actually making it to the uh, to the FCU branch. Interesting. All right. So let, let me just be, make sure I understand this. So you dealt with the ulnar nerve, and it sounds like that was, I don't want to say straightforward, but it, in the end, we understand what you did. And then you didn't just excise the neuroma or bury the stump. You excised the neuroma. You brought an expensive allograft in. You sutured it to the uh, residual MABC, and then you put that allograft into the FCU. It wasn't that expensive. I mean, come on. <laughs> Compared to some of the arthroscopy stuff that you use, oh, come on. all those fancy, all those fancy suture tapes. I mean, uh, in this grand scheme of things, yeah. If it yes, works, but that's that's yeah. yes. The allograph was an intercalary between the MABC and the um 
and the FCU branch. And this is something that I've done before. Obviously, I've done TMR before, and I've done TMR in painful neuroma cases. Uh, I remember one, uh, you're going to laugh at this, a revision Morton neuroma case. Uh, she had kind of had surgery Isn't elsewhere. That in the foot? In. Yeah, it's in the foot. <laughs> yep. And uh, did TMR. And so one of the, uh, uh, one of the foot interossei, and it was great. <laughs> Do you even know what they're called? <laughs> so it's a it lumbrical interossei, some kind of intrinsic muscle in the foot that most people let die, but you know. <laughs> nice. Um, um, but yeah, no, that that was a very, and it, it's nice because for that particular situation, uh, you know exactly where the nerve is going to go. You don't risk it dislodging out of muscle. I know the other option, obviously, and I've done this a lot before too, and so have you, is to implant the buried, the cut end of the nerve into muscle. And that's still, I think, a great go-to treatment. I mean, what one of the take-homes I had from the ASPN meeting was um, that there's, I mean, there's no, it's not going to be always TMR or RPNI or whatever other treatment you have for a painful neuroma. It's knowing about how to do all of them because there are going to be some nerves in particular that are going to respond better to each different treatment. And then some scenarios in which you're not going to have other options. So it is important to know kind of the full spectrum. Love it. Love it. Um, if I well, may. Yeah. Let's, ahead. let's hear it. Let's hear a case from you. Sure. I, I was debating, I, I try to, some of the, my most interesting cases are congenital cases. And I recognize that a lot of the audience, uh, you know, might find them interesting, but might not truly relate. So I want to share, and I'm not going to share a sports, a complete sportsy case, but I'm going to share an adolescent case. So 15-year-old male uh, comes in with a DREJ dislocation uh, and a history of fracture. Now, if someone walked in and said that to me or one of my colleagues said that to me, my brain would immediately go to distal one-third of the radius fracture, malunion, ulna ends up dorsally. In those cases, I love when those I mean, I hate for the kids, but when that case walks in, um, I know I can make that child better by correcting the radius deformity. So really like that. And and that's that's in an adolescent, you know, in, in someone our age or your age or my age, it may not be so straightforward, but in a younger patient, it's a great case. Is that scenario typically the one where they're going to remodel, but they didn't remodel? Yeah, when they're going to re when they're 13 and they're going to remodel 40 degrees. And right. I had, I had air quotes with my going to remodel for those of you that are not watching on YouTube. Yes, exactly. So this case was interesting because this patient had a procedure done, a soft tissue procedure of some sort done near the distal ulna. And I believe the growth plate may have been affected. And so it overgrew dorsally uh, with the growth plate was still growing normally there. And that led to a dislocation of the DREJ. Um, what kind of soft tissue procedure would bugger up the physis? I think it was an unusual mass of some sort, uh, okay. which was volar and close. And I don't know the details. Um, okay. So this is like some kind of, well, in the distal ulna, like a volar physial bar almost from some kind of trauma or yeah. surgical traumas, presumably? I, I think that was happening. The, the physis was now closed. We're left with this deformity and we're left with a patient who couldn't rotate. Got it. Okay. Really interesting. And so it's it. I was hoping uh, that it would turn out like it, it would had the radius been the issue. Um, and so we went in. We did a, a closing wedge osteotomy on the ulna um, and put a volar plate on, which corrected the obvious angulation asymmetry to the other side. I always X-ray the opposite side. Volar plate on the radius. Put Roll. a volar plate on. We did a closing um, wedge osteotomy on the ulna. On the ulna. Yeah. And then we basically closed it down. So the, the ulna was sitting dorsal. And then we closed it down, put the plate on, and it um, went right back into the DREJ. And in the OR, we did a DREJ release. I don't know if we had to or not. In the OR, we had immediate full restoration of motion. It's kind of remarkable. That um, is pretty impressive. So just because it was sitting out of the sigmoid notch and you got it back into the sigmoid notch then? I think it's that simple. And and I just, it, it gives me, you know, there's so much um, A, remodeling potential in young patients, but B, just tolerance to different things. And so if we, if we can recreate the normal anatomy in a lot of these situations, the kids bounce back amazingly fast. It's, it's really, really exciting, I think. Yeah, that's that's a crazy case. That's great. Uh, how did you pick your implant? Did you decide, was this just something that you use kind of a standard, what, a mini frag or a, a small frag plate? Or did you actually use the kind of normal 
ulnar shortening osteotomy set, which may not work for a 13 year old. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. I always struggle with implants around the distal ulna. I don't know about you, but when there's fractures of the distal ulna, for example, or in this case where we're doing a very distal osteotomy, I never know exactly what the right plate to use is. I usually have some type of 2024, 27 plate available. And that's what I did in this case. It was, a, I think it was a 2-3 plate, but it was locking, uh, which is nice to have. The bone actually was pretty disappointing, I guess, because there hadn't been motion of the forearm for a year. And um, it, it just came together nicely. And, and nowadays with the more rigid, smaller plates, I think you'd be pretty comfortable with your ability to obtain and maintain a reduction. Now, how would you, uh, what would be, what, what's the post-op protocol for that patient? I mean, how, how much are you going to protect that? Obviously you want to get this thing moving because the patient hasn't been moving their forearm in a while. Yeah. Two weeks in a splint for me. And then two weeks in, you know, a surgically applied splint. And then I see them back in the office and I'll have them in a therapy fabricated splint with early active motion, nothing passive. Um, and then hopefully by five or six weeks, they're healed. And then we ramp up from there. So you know, still, still, um, you know, the, uh, this, it's been about four weeks. So I need to see the patient back in a couple more weeks and see how they're doing, but their two week visit, they were already doing pretty well. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah, that's, that's great. I just got a clarifying question. Um, given what we're dealing with here is your post-op splint that you fabricated a sugar tongue and is the therapy splint going to be a monster or are you letting them kind of move ad lib and something below, uh, below elbow? Yeah. I'm curious as to what you do when I operate on the radius, or if I have a foveal TFCC repair, I tend to do a sugar tong to start and then a Munster. When I operate on the ulna, as I did in this case, I think of as it as the constant unit with the radius rotating around it. So I just did a short arm splint. And, and I debated the longer, but I, I just went with the short arm splint. How do you think about those situations? Um, I, I guess the only way, I, the only... If I'm worried about the um, about the DRUJ, um, that's when I go above elbow with the sugar tongue and a monster. Um, you know, for purely for like an ulnar shortening osteotomy in which it's more for pain and less for stability, I'm okay with something below elbow. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that for sure. Um, the other cool case as we wrap up. I've had two really interesting cases. And again, this is a little in the pediatric and congenital world. But as, as you remember, Dr. D, Allier's disease is multiple enchondromatosis. And the enchondromas can really affect um, growth of the bones. And so I've had two of those in the last few weeks um, where I've lengthened the radius. And uh, for one of them, I did a osteotomy and application of an external fixator to gradually lengthen. We needed more length. And the other one, I did a step cut. And I haven't done a lot of step cut osteotomies where you can get about a centimeter and a half or sometimes a little more. Um, it can be kind of fun. It's also a little harrowing because I worry about swelling um, when you do one stage lengthenings, but uh, um, thankfully uh, all went well, but fun cases. Step cut. It's step cut. Very interesting. Technically, is that uh, is that something that you find very challenging aside from the consideration for the swelling? But I mean, getting the carpentry just right must be very challenging. Um. I, it worked well. We had we had Jessica uh, Billick, our fellow, was there. She was great. And what we did was we worked in the metaphysis of the distal radius near um, or, or in the site of the enchondroma, which usually is a good thing. They tend to heal well in that area. And we essentially made a longitudinal, used some K-wires longitudinally. We did about a centimeter and a half. And then we exited on one side distally, exited on one side proximally, put two smooth laminar spreaders in, one on each side and spread and things were well aligned and we put a long enough plate on that we had good security proximal and distal and then one one transverse screw as well so pretty 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 good i mean it, it's got a heel but i was pretty encouraged sounds pretty slick is that is do you treat that like any other osteotomy in terms of post-op protocols and rehab yeah i would go on, on the step cut i would I really monitored for compartment syndrome and i think we go a little slow till we see some callus formation given that we're depending on a plate and a narrow bridge of connecting bone, but uh, right. um, yeah, th th it's going to heal well. The beauty is these things heal really well, but two Allier's, Allier's cases, um, that's a lot. That's, it, that is a lot. Uh, you have your boutique uh, practice. Is there a blog post coming perhaps? 
you know what? There should be if I was on my social media game. I did delete Twitter, but I had to reinstall it. <laughs> what? What? Why'd you have to reinstall it? I just needed to follow up some on some stuff. And I want to get back into the Journal of Hand Surgery Twitter Journal Club. And that obviously ah. you acquire Twitter for that. Yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. I think uh, Twitter is all it's way beyond the scope of this podcast. One of the things I listen to uh, outside of our uh, stuff is uh, Pivot. Um, and we, we've talked about Scott Galloway before. But the amount of time they talk about Elon Musk and, and Twitter is disproportionate. It is a little too much. But So I know a lot about what's going on at Twitter. And I admit, I have not opened Twitter really much in the last few months because of all this craziness going on. I know. I know. I'm not gonna, It's not going to be part of my daily routine to go there. I do like Instagram. Um, you know, but I'm old, so <laughs> no one expects much of me on on those on those forums. But that means that you are exceeding everybody's expectations. <laughs> yes. Well, all right. Once... Well, you have a great uh, rest of the day. You too. Good to see you. Take care. Nice seeing you.